Thanks for joining us for today's message, where we desire to reach people, transform lives, and make Jesus famous. You can hear more life-transforming messages on our website at www.theheck.org. That's www.thehec.org. Go with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Amen. Matthew chapter 13. Good morning, HEC family and friends. Near and far, we're so excited and delighted that you are here in the place to be. Amen. The Bible says that when Ezra opened the book, that the people stood from sun up to sundown, amen, while he brought the word of the Lord, amen. We honor the Lord this morning. We would ask that you would grab your Bibles, your devices, go with us to Matthew chapter 13. We're looking at the seventh parable in Matthew chapter 13 and the final parable in Matthew chapter 13. It's not Matthew's last parable, but in this particular uh, uh, chapter of verses, we're looking at this se- the seventh parable. Uh, may read in your heading the parable of the net or the parable of the drag net, something like that. When you have it, say amen. It's just a few verses. Uh, listen to what he says, reading from the CSB Bible. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like. Now, I like the, I like the King James because it says the kingdom of heaven can be likened unto. But the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. And it collected every kind of fish. And when it was full, they dragged it ashore, sat down, and gathered the good fish into the containers, but threw out the worthless ones. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You may be seated in the presence of our life-changing king. We've looked at so far six parables in our shareable parable series for the summer. We looked at the parable of the sower, and we discovered in that particular parable that uh, all soil is not good soil. That actually that only 25% of the soil actually produced something worth producing. We also discovered in the parable of the wheat and tare that, that sometimes false prophet and false believers infiltrate the church. And, and, and the question was, should we tear up? Should, should we pull the tear up? He says, no, let them grow together because similar to this parable, he says that when the right time comes, we'll separate the wheat from the tear and we'll throw the tear into the furnace to be burned. We learned that from the, from the mustard seed that we learned that, uh, 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 that, 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 that the purpose of the grain of the mustard seed is about spiritual growth and development, right? That we, 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 we learned that it also has uh, end time implications, that, that a little leaven leavens the whole lump, that it doesn't take much to get us thrown off, get us off course, get us, get us turned around, get us, get, us, get us messed up, that you only need, uh, I think it was Dr. Tapman who said that if you have 95% truth and 5% lie, it's all a lie. Amen. That stuck with me. That stuck with me. That's one I, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get to use as I have three grandsons at some point. Amen. Then last week, we looked at the treasure of the hidden field and the pearl of great price. And what I loved about last week's sermon is that we were told that we are the illustration, that, 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 that we are the illustration. And, and, and as he wrapped up the sermon, he wanted to know how much are we, are we in search of the pearl of great price, the gospel of Jesus Christ and its expansion. This week, we're looking at the parable of the net or the drag net. And as we enter this seventh and final parable in Matthew 13, you'll notice that most of the parables start with these words. It says, the kingdom of God is like or can be likened unto. We've discovered that parables use ordinary, everyday life happenings and objects to communicate often a single kingdom truth. These particular parables seem to have uh, end time implications throughout most of these parables that should stick with us. And this morning's parable will we'll use examples near and dear the disciples' heart. And the reason for that is that he's using elements of fishing. Now, before we jump in, fishing has become one of my most enjoyable hobbies. Uh, I live near a lake 
And uh, every chance I get, I get my little pole, my little worms. I was trying hot dogs yesterday. Didn't work so well for me. Amen. Uh, somebody told me it worked, so I, I gave it a shot. You know, I get my little pole, my little worms, and I go on out to the lake with my little chair, sometimes with my Bible, sometimes with my prayer card. But I'm here to tell you that whenever the Bible goes under, I stop praying for y'all. And I'm on to the fish. I'm on to the fish. And so, uh, uh, and I've been having a great time. I've been having an amazing time. You know, but, but, but I fish in a particular way that most of you are familiar with. You, you bait the hook. And, for, and quite honestly, for a while, I was baiting the hook wrong. I was trying to get all my worm on the hook, not knowing that you need to leave some of the worm hanging out so that it's attractive to the fish. So when I changed that game up, man, listen here. I've had seven days, seven consecutive outings where I've caught three or more fish. Come on now, somebody. Amen. <laughs> Man, listen, I've, I've been on it. Listen, listen. And at first, my family was like, we ain't eating that. I said, no problem. After I, after I sliced it up and filleted it, put a little, put a, put a little seasoning on it, threw a, little, threw a little batter on it, put it on. Now, now, listen, they walking around like this here. They on the slip trying to get a little bit of it. I said, okay. Yeah, this is better than H-E-B fish. This is fresh fish, right? But I was out fishing, and these guys came along, and they had a small net. Now, mind you, I'm out there, you know, I'm getting sunburned, I'm getting the hooks getting caught in my hand, I'm tripping about to fall into the lake because I didn't got a bite, I didn't got so excited. Every time I'm like a kid. But they came out with this net, and the dude throws the net. And I say, what in kind of foolery is this? And then he pulls the net back to himself, and there he has six or seven catfish. Now, he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him. I'm a little disgusted with him at this point. But if I tell the truth, I'm jealous. Because I've been out here for a minute trying to catch something, and here he is with this net. And know what he said? He, had, he, said, he said, hey, amigo, you want some catfish? <laughs> okay. I see it's going to be one of them kind of days. You know how jealous I was? I started thinking, is this illegal? <laughs> Could I call the game warden right now and get them picked up? And here they are scaring off all my fish from my pole. I say, but next time I'm going to be ready. So now when I go over, I got four poles. Yeah, I'm going to show you that I'm a better fisherman because that's easy fishing. I actually call that cheating. That's cheating. Now, I will admit, I will admit, I will admit, you know, when I come back, my wife normally say, what you catch? Right? I said, well, I caught some little ones. They were too small. I threw them back. And, and, and just, so, just so integrity is in the game, I take pictures now. Right. So I got almost as many pictures this summer of me and the wife as and me and the fish. All right. And so and so but I did think yesterday to cheat. I said, maybe I should go to the sporting goods place and get me one of them nets. <laughs> then come back and I put them all on my little chain and come back and say, look what I caught. All right. I say, no, no, no. I'm going to stick at it the old fashioned way. And so and so as we look at our text this morning. The text, again, it, it, it reminds us that Jesus is telling them he's using this analogy that his disciples would have understood. He uses this. Now, here's, here, here's the deal. Some scholars say that this is a warning parable. They, they argue that this is a warning parable to the whole world and especially the church, that Jesus is given a warning to, 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 to respond to the gospel before it's too late. Then there are the practical pictures in the parable that the church, we have an opportunity to reach as many people as possible by casting a large gospel net. Those are the two common deals. But the parable, like the wheat in the tar, reminds us of good and evil can coexist at the same time. We know that in our world. We know that, 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 that good things happen and evil things can happen at the same time. You could be enjoying your life just as an individual having the best time of your life, and the doctor gives you a bad report at the same time. We know that good and evil exist because this the summer, and most of us will have some type of family gathering, and some good folk are coming, and then some folk coming that's not so good. It's some folk coming that you know that about two hours in, they're going to they turn up and turn the family gathering into something else. Good and evil can coexist at the same time. Jesus uses this parable 
because I believe it's of the, of the, of the, this is the third parable where he's only talking to his disciples, and I believe he uses this parable because he wants to get their attention as he is preparing them for gospel mission. Look with me, if you don't mind, at Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, because I think he uses this parable because he wants to heighten their senses because at least four of them were fishermen. Look what he says in Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 8. He says, as the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, he was standing by the lake of Gersonet, or the lake of Galilee, and he saw two boats at the edge of the lake. Now, this is important, these two boats. I need you to remember that. Two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left and were washing their nets. And he got in one of the boats, which belonged to Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And there he sat down and he started teaching the crowds from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Can I say this? Anything that you give to Jesus, he's going to give something back to you. That's why I don't understand people who don't give. Anything you give to God, he's going to give something back to you. Amen. If you give your life back to God, he's going to give you a better life. Amen. Give your marriage to God. Amen. He's going to give you a better husband or a better wife. Amen. Give your children back to God. God, eventually, when they get over all their foolishness and prodigalness, God's going to give you back a better child. If anything you give back to God that you totally surrender, to totally surrender, brothers and sisters, means that we must take our hands off of it. It's not God's as long as, as long as you got your hands on it or you got some pre-existing conditions attached to it. But look what it says here. It says, he told them, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now listen to Simon. Simon replied, we've worked hard all night. We've toiled at this all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, we'll let down our net. It says, and when they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled the other partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. See, that's what it means in Psalms 23 when he says, my cup runneth over. Amen. That's the blessings of the Lord. That, 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 and, and, and here's what I love about God. God always blesses us with so much that we have so much more to give. That's why that should never be a thing called a stingy Christian. This is just my side note. I don't know why I'm here. I just want to get these side notes, but I just, I just want to give it. Amen. And so, and so I told the elder of finance one day, I said, you ought to give people letters that's, you know, because you ought to be getting letters sometime this week for your, all the way through your, your giving, and then before the end of the month, we'll talk about giving. But I say, those people who don't give, you ought to give them a letter that says, thank you so much for giving, and put a big zero on it. <laughs> amen. Not, not, not to make them feel bad, but to let them know, amen. This might be the reason <laughs> you got so many problems. I'm just saying. Let me go on, let me go on, let me go on, let me go on, let me go on. Amen, amen. Let me get back to the text. And so, and so look, so, so, so when Simon saw this, he fell at his knees and said, go away from me for I'm a sinful, I'm sinful man, Lord. For he and all those who were amazed at the catch of the fish that he had taken, right? And then it tells you that it was the sons of Zebedee was other sons of Thumb and Simon's partners. And he says, don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon, for now you will be catching people. Two things I need you to remember from this text as we get ready to go through our text, that they cast a large net, and then Jesus told them, from now on, you'll be catching people. Now to our text. Look with me here at our first takeaway. The gospel must be exposed to everyone. Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 through 48. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a large net thrown into the sea. It collected every kind of fish. Take, take a moment, look around, look around the room. Every kind of person is in this room. Black people and white people, brown people, Hispanic people, right? Some of y'all, some of y'all have, have Jamaican roots and Puerto Rican roots and, uh, and, 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 and Salvadoran roots and, 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 and African roots and, 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 and European roots, but every kind of people, right? He says, and when it was full, they dragged the net to shore, sat down, gathered the good fish from the containers, and do the worthless ones away. So the gospel must be exposed to work. Jesus introduced this parable by telling us the kingdom of heaven is like catching fish in a lake. The net here is a picture of what they call a drag net. Now, people fished three ways back then. They fished like our fish with a little pole, and they just try to get what they can get, hand them off fishing. And then sometimes they would fish, they would have a little net like my amigos had that they just throw out there and get the fish. But a drag net was different. 
A drag net required two boats, and it covered a large space, and the boats would spread out. They would start at the shore, and they would roll out the net, and the nets had weights on them, and then the nets would fall down all the way to the bottom of the lake, and when it hit the bottom, they would wait, and then they would paddle the boats all the way back in, and when they got to shore, there would be people there on the shore who would help them pull the nets in, and when they pulled the nets in, they would then go through, they would go through the net, and whatever was what was marketable and edible, they would keep, and what wasn't, they would throw back into the sea. You say, how did they know what was edible and marketable? Well, if you go over to Leviticus, it's either 19 or 13, somewhere in there, it talks about uh, clean and unclean fish. And it says anything with scales and fans that Jews would have eaten and anything else they would have not eaten. They, would, they, they were still under that, that, that idea of the law. They hadn't fully embraced grace yet. They hadn't got to where Peter says, uh, Jesus tells Peter, whatever I call clean, don't you call unclean. They weren't like us, just bless it and eat it. And so, and so it says they would, they, 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 they would, they, so, so they threw back anything that was not consumable. Now notice that it says it catches all kinds of fish. All kinds of fish, right? Right. All kinds. All kinds of fish means that not all fish should be ate. All fish are not are not edible. Now, I particularly I like catfish because I figured out how to fillet a catfish without the bones, right? But 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 my mom when they grew up because they grew up poor, my mom had a saying when she fished: if it get caught on my hook, we eat it. My my father in law was the same way. My father in law catch, catch a turtle. It's supposed to be a fish. We having turtle soup. Amen. <laughs> We haven't turtle soup. I used to watch him because I saw him catch some snakes, cut the head off. I said, now what are he going to do with that? I just want to make sure it ain't going to end up in the pot. <laughs> and so, and so, and so, but it says it was all kind of fish. Now, here's what you got to know. There was, there was, there was, there were over 24 species of fish in the Sea of Galilee, but not all those fish were useful. In fact, I would probably say that if they caught something like a carp, they threw it back because it had so many bones in it. So, 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 so let's, just, let's, let, let's just imagine. They poured it all in. They had all kind of fish. And then them and their workers went through. And whatever was useful, they kept. And whatever was not useful, they didn't keep. But, but here was the deal that you got to catch. That, that, that the net went out, right? And every fish in the sea had the opportunity to be caught up in the net. When the gospel goes out. Every person who hears has the opportunity to respond or reject the gospel. We're not called to discriminate, right? There should not. Can I say this? I know, I know, I know some of my partners are going to hear this because they watch and they're going to they call me and they're going to call me on this. But I truly believe based on what I read in scripture, there should not be a black church, a white church, a Spanish church. And there should just be a church based on what I read in Revelations, how it's set up in heaven. Because we like to say the Lord's first as it is in heaven, let it so be on earth that there should be a church of every nation, tribe and tongue under heaven. And that your church should look like your community. And unless you live in the community that's all black, all white, all Hispanic. Your church should look like this church. It should have some of everybody in it. And it should not be a middle class church and a broke church, amen, and a rich church. And a, no, it should be a church where people have GEDs and PhDs, amen, where people are on minimum wage and people are maxing out their 401k. It should be a church, amen, that we're in this together. That's the picture that he's painting when he says, that they, they cast this large net. He says that the gospel, the idea that he's trying to make the disciples see is that, is that what you're about to get into is not, is, is not to discriminate. It's for everybody. Just cast the net, and when, the, and when you pull it in, here, here's, here's the picture, we'll separate the good from the evil. Now, unlike the wheat and the tear, and the wheat and the tear, somebody infiltrated the church. But what he's saying now, catch this. Oh, y'all, listen, y'all, listen. What he's saying now is that folk can sit in the church, amen, they didn't infiltrate, they look like, they smell like, they talk like, they may be sitting next to you this morning, they may be evil people who don't know the law. He says, but, and that's why the gospel is so important, that they were already inside the net. They didn't infiltrate it, the, the purpose of the net was to pull them in. Now, let me say this to you. If you're not where you're supposed to be with God this morning, don't feel bad. Just keep on striving to get where God wants you to be, that there is plenty of grace upon grace for you. And listen, listen, listen. God is not legalistic. He's not looking for you to check some boxes like tic-tac-toe and draw a line across it. God wants you to be all in. Now, 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 now here's what I mean by that. Hey, Amen. God is not looking for perfect people. He's looking for obedient people. And so, and so, so, so don't, don't mistake that. You may, you may have some issues. But you still may be the kind of fish that God keeps. 
Because God works with broken people. Amen. And God is like me when he goes fishing. Sometimes I don't throw back the little fish. I say, God must have meant for you to be in the pan too. It'd be so disappointing for me not for me to throw you back out there and you just die. Amen. Let me let me let me let me use you for the purpose for which you was created. Man. Sometimes I catch the fish and I talk to him. I say, boy, you're gonna look good with hot sauce on you. Hot sauce. I'll be naming the fish. Amen. You're going to get some of your smack your mama seasoning on. You're going to smell so good. Because, you know, when you first catch fish, they don't smell good. But after you fry the fish, ain't that, a, ain't that amazing that raw fish stinks, but fried fish smells good to your senses? See, look, some of y'all thinking about fish right now. Some of y'all saying, listen, shout out to this is it. Some of y'all saying, I'm going to make it to this is it. I'm going to get me some fish today. No. So watch this. So, so, so here's the deal. Let's flip the script, though. Let's flip the script. Because the gospel is exposed to everyone. The result is... The result is this, that, that, that no one can escape the judgment. Look with me again, right? Remember Matthew chapter 4, he was pointing out the need. In Matthew chapter 4, he tells the disciples, I'm going to make you fishers of men. That's the need for evangelism. In Matthew 13, he's now pointing out judgment for those who reject evangelism. So, so now let's look. Uh, Matthew 13, verses 49 and 50. He says, so it will be at the end of the age. At the end of the age. At the end of the age. Now, there's argument about what that text means, the end of the age, right? People, people are all over the place on what that means. I'm going to keep it simple. And when I explain it, the angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous. Somebody underline that in your Bible. It says that the angels will go out. Not, not me and you. The angels will go out and separate the evil people, the righteous from the unrighteous. Because here's the deal. You and I can't even pick right cars. We know we can't pick right people. Mm -hmm. Some of us got broke pickers anyway. We always picking the wrong people. Uh -huh. That's why I tell single people, you ought to bring your boo to church because collectively we might be able to get your picker fixed. You might have a bad picker. You know? I done told some sister, sister, you picked the wrong one. He ain't the one. He ain't the one. He is not the one. I shook his hand and knew he wasn't the one. Pastor, how do you know that? He's not the one. He's not the one. He smelled too good. He looked too good. He don't want to work. He ain't the one. <laughs> Amen. He came in here telling me he's trying to become a, uh, he's 40, talking about he finna become a, a, a gamer. No, you too old to be a gamer. You should have started that at four. Huh? Uh-uh. Don't be giving me no Samuel L. Jackson stories. It's too late for you, buddy. What you need to do is get a shovel and a vest and get out here on this road and, and bring some money in. Listen, if he ain't bringing in no money, because the Bible says if a man don't work, he ain't... Come on up in here, H-E-C. Woo! I love this church right there. Woo! Boy, listen, listen, boy, listen. That was so harmonic. Listen, boy, that was quite light. They say, boy, he should not eat. Boy, listen. Elders, y'all doing a good job. Here, here. So listen, listen, listen. Verses 13, 4, 9, 15 says, so at the end of the age, now this is where it gets serious. The angels will go out and separate the evil people from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace. I don't want you to be confused. He's talking about hell. Something that we don't talk about often in this 21st century church. Everybody wants to go to heaven and nobody wants to go to hell. But don't you know that if some are going to heaven... Some are going to hell, and not because you tell it to somebody. That's because they've not accepted Jesus. Amen? Oh, y'all going to catch on. Y'all going to catch on. He says, well, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice that the good and the bad, the evil and the wicked exist together in the world. It's almost impossible Right. Apart from consistent actions to tell who's good and who's truly bad. And then even we can. So so we can understand that 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 mark the mark of difference is that some of us have surrendered to God and are covered in his righteousness. And some have not surrendered to God and are living under the banner of unrighteousness. And on the day of judgment, God will separate the two. Will separate the two. I've had the privilege of telling older family members that you are not saved. They say, well, I joined the church. But joining the church don't save you. Baptism does not save you. You might even speak in tongues and still not be saved. 
unless you surrender to Jesus. That's what saved you. Well, I gave the preacher my hand. Well, you just shook another dirty man's hand. Y'all just exchanged germs if you did not surrender yourself to Jesus. People who don't surrender themselves to Jesus are going to hell. I know parents have a hard time with this. Listen, the greatest deal you can do, parents, is not buy them a new gaming system, buy them a car when they're 16, pay for their education. The most important thing you can do is make sure that your children know who Jesus is. Amen. If my children are mad at me but love Jesus, I won. So listen, listen, the gospel would have been proclaimed to the whole world. Right to the whole world when God pulls up the net. Some people will struggle with the idea that, that, that God will have judgment when it comes, right? But 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 yet first Peter reminds us that judgment, catch this here, starts in the household of God. There's going to be judgment at the end of time. God is going to judge the righteous and the unrighteous. He's going to He's going to separate sheep from goat. He's going, to re- he's going to separate the unrighteous from the righteous. He's going to make a difference. God's going to make a difference, not you and I. And so, so listen to this verse. For the time will come, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, for, for the time will come for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who disobey the gospel of God? He says the time is coming, 1 Peter 4, 17, when judgment will start in the household of faith. And if it's coming for us, if we're going to have to stand before the bema seat as righteous and covered in the blood and walk them in and then give them rewards according to how obedient we were and walk upright before God. Because we're getting in. Don't get me wrong. You're getting in. I tell y'all, some of us going to be blinged out and the money down. And some of us going to have overalls on, Right? And ball caps, but you're going to be in. And that's the important thing. You got in. Some of us going to be blinging and singing, and some of us just going to be bland, but we're going to be in. Now, listen, our text states that at the end of the age, a simple way to understand this is that when Jesus returns, the end of the age, when Jesus returns with his angels and pronounces judgment, the end of the age. I can get into a whole lot of technical uh, jargon as you study this text out, what the end of the age looks like, rumors and wars, rumors of wars, and the angels, and the great right battle, and the throne. And right, You can go through all that. Here's the end of the age. When Jesus returns, you're either right or you're not. You're either in or you out. L- l- listen, Jesus is not like your elementary school teacher. There will be no do-overs. There will be no second chances, third chances. No, 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 no. You either got it or you didn't. Listen, you say, okay, pastor, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds kind of hard. That sounds kind of hard. That sounds kind of hard. Well, look with me. Look with me. Matthew 25. I'm not going to read it all. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. Just look at verses 33 through 30 and 34. Look what he says. Matthew 25. Listen. He says, he, and, well, start at 31. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all his angels with him, He will sit on his glorious throne and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate them one from another, just as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. Notice who's doing it. God is doing the separating. And then look what it says. Verse 33, 34. He says, and he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. Right. So it says all those who receive Jesus, who, who, who heard the gospel call, man, who put who put saving faith in him. He says, come on. But then look at verse 41. Right. He is some dialogue between these. But then look at verse 41. He says, then he will also say to those on his left. Remember, sheep and goat, those on his left. Depart from me, you who are cursed into eternal fire, prepared for who? The devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. You did not take care of me. I was naked and you not clothed me, sick and in prison. You not take care of me. And then then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry, naked, thirsty, all these things? And then he will answer and say, I tell you, whatever you do to the least of these, you've done unto me. Then it says, verse 46, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
both the good and the bad, the righteous and the unrighteous will have eternal life. One into eternal punishment and judgment and one into eternal life and provisions with God. Listen. Notice that both the righteous and un unrighteous, as demonstrated by the analogy of sheep and goat, are living in the same space, hearing the same things, seeing the same things, given the same opportunities to hear and obey God. Yet one chooses life on their terms and the other on God's terms. The members of the church are constantly being reminded that, that though they are in the world, they're not of the world. And so here's what he's saying. He says you have to choose life on God's terms. So he gives them this analogy. They're pulling it all in. God's going to pull it all in. And then he's going to separate those that are his and those that are not. And those that are not, he says, they will be thrown into hell with the devil and his angels, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Why do people think they can live like hell and go to heaven? You know why? Because the church keeps telling them they can. It's okay. You're okay. You're a good person. You got time. Mm -hmm. God understands. Not according to these scriptures. According to these scriptures, they that reject Jesus will be, he will throw them into the burning furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. God will not be a just God if he did not execute justice on the unrighteous. Everybody wants to be in the courtroom with the judge that doesn't give out sentences. But we know that, we, we, we know that, we know that that's, that's, that's a misnomer. That's impossible. Listen, and some people will say, some people try to argue hell away. Hell is a real place reserved for real people for a real eternity. That's what, the, that's what this parable is talking about. And then look, you say, okay, you say, okay pastor. How do you know? The, the Bible says, and we just read in Matthew 25, 41, Mark 9, 43, that there is eternal fire. When you read in Luke 16, 19 through 31, you see the consciousness of suffering. You see the awareness of a choice made. You see that there are no second chances. You can see, you can see darkness and solitude. But here's probably what makes hell so, trimble, so terrible and terrifying is that those that are in hell are eternally separated from God. Here's my last text I want you to look at. Because I was trying to figure out how to flush it out. And I figured the only way to flush it out is to let the Bible speak. 2 Thessalonians verse 1 and 9. You know, I've met pastors who don't believe in hell, but believe in heaven. They said, God would never send anybody there. I said, well, what gospel are you preaching? If nobody's going to hell, then we're all just good people. Make more, make, more, make more cookies and brownies and let's just, listen, let's just go home. Let's party all the way out. Why did Jesus come? Why did, he, why did he hang on a cross? Why was he beaten till he was unrecognizable, stripped of all his clothes, hung on a cross, bled a crown of thorns pressed into his head, and to blood rained down like rain and tears? Why would he endure such a deal if there is no heaven or hell, if there's no hell? He did it so that he can redeem, pay the price that, that hell is demanding. So here... Here's probably the most terrifying deal about eternal life, about hell. First, Second Thessalonians verse 1 and 9 says, These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction from the Lord's presence and from his glorious strength. And his glory. You know, you, you know the worst thing about hell is that you are forever separated from the presence of God. You are forever separated from the presence of God, from feeling the God touch in your life. People say, well, what about the weeping and gnashing of teeth? What about, what about the soul that dies not? What about the worms that don't burn? No, you know what's worse is that I will never be able to call on the name of the Lord. I will never be able to be in the presence of God. I won't be with the four and 24 elders who are singing, holy, holy, holy. All I'll be saying is help, help, help. That's what hell is. That's what hell is. Hell is not Satan's home. It is the punishment for Satan and his angels. That's why in Revelation 20 and 10, it says, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beasts and the false prophets had been thrown. 
and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so, brothers and sisters, why we laugh when we should, the Bible says that we ought to have joyful times. And why we sing and celebrate, and we should. Because the Bible tells us, sing unto the Lord a new song. There are some serious moments in our Christian walk and with those that we love where we live, work, play, and stay that we must warn people that the end is near and it's coming and that hell is real and that to die without hope in Jesus, faith in Jesus, gets you a one-way ticket on the fastest spiritual train possible to hell. And let me tell you how y'all know that some of y'all can't take hell. If we turn off this AC, y'all going to be complaining. <laughs> y'all don't even want to go outside. Especially some of you sisters because you know your hair going to fall all the way down. Huh? I was looking the other day. I was looking at my arm. My wife say, my wife say, are you trying to see if you're dark or not? I said, I think I've been sunburned. Right? My arm was burning and scratching. Is that the other? Yeah. Listen, you can't take the heat outside if you can't take the heat in hell. Old folks says, if you can't stand the heat, get out the kitchen. If you can't stand the heat, let her get out of hell today. Today, Jesus wants to offer you a get out of hell card. He wants you to put your trust in him and in him alone. This is better than monopoly. So we must make a conscious choice. Whom we will serve, either God or the devil. Heaven awaits the righteous, not because we're good. Listen to this. Not because we could, but because Jesus is good. And he is righteous. And he has put his righteousness on us. It is the picture of the prodigal son when the father runs out and he takes, he takes, he takes the best robe and he covers the son. That's what God does with his righteousness. He takes his righteousness and he covers us with it. You can know for sure today that you are among the righteous if you have asked Christ to forgive your sins and given God your whole life. The Bible says, whomsoever believes in him will not die but have eternal life. You today can have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's dragging the net in slowly. He's dragging the net in slowly. He's dragging the net in slowly. And when the net finally gets to the shore, you're either among the righteous or the unrighteous. You're either heaven bound or hell bound. I tell you what Joshua told Israel, choose this day whom you're going to serve choose this day. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we thank you. We thank you this morning, God, Father, that you have made provisions. God, we have saw through multiple parables so far in the shareable parables, God, that you are giving warnings, God. You're giving, you're, you're, you're giving encouragement, God, Father. You're calling the church to be great. You're calling us from average to amazing. But God, you're calling us as a church, but you're also calling us individually. There may be somebody here today that says, I have time. When I do this, then God. Then God. I'm saying to you, no, God today, then all of that. God, if there's somebody among us and listening online or here who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we want to extend them an invitation. God, that when the end of time is drawn in, when the, when the net has been poured in, God, when the gospel has been proclaimed for the last time, that they will find themselves standing with the righteous. If you're here and you don't know them, today is your day. Today is your day. Tomorrow's promise to nobody. Watch the news. Read a newspaper. Somebody died younger than you. I know preachers don't talk like this anymore. But tomorrow's promise to no man. I may not even be here next week. The Lord can call me home. But here's what y'all can say at my funeral. He's living now more than he's ever lived. So, Father, draw people to yourself. We pray. If you're here and you need Jesus, you can simply stand. We'll pray with you. We'll lead you. We'll walk with you. If you're unsure, 
we want you to know for sure that you are his. If you're lukewarm, we want you to get hot for God. And Revelations, when he says he's standing at the door and knocking, he's not talking to the world. He's talking to the church. He wants us to be right with him. Father, make us whole. Make us complete in you, we pray. In Jesus' name. And the church said amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a hand of praise on this morning. Hallelujah. We pray today's message was a blessing to you. If you are in the Humble area, please stop by and be our guest. For service times and directions, visit our website at www.theheck.org. That's www.thehec.org.